Sometimes when I start a video, I just know it's going to get a lot of hate, and that's going to happen with this one because I'm looking at an Apple product, and it seems like half the people on my channel seem to really get upset about some stranger on the internet's choice of computing platform. But yeah, I've bought a Mac Mini, so we're going to take a look at it. Now the reason I bought this is to use in my living room. Currently I've got a really old PC hooked up to the TV, it's like a old AMD FX 4300, and it's got like a GT 1030 in it just so I can get a 4K 60Hz output. But it's an old rack mount machine and I'm trying to tidy that area up and I wanted something a lot smaller. And while I could have gone for like a NUC or a little Dell Optiplex or something small form factor like that, I just wanted a Mac, I just, I'm a bit tired of Windows, I wanted a Mac OS machine, so I went for this. Now normally when I buy Apple products, I buy them second hand because that saves so much money. But that's quite tricky to do with the Mac Mini. The two newest versions are the 2018 model and then the 2014 model before that, with nothing in between. The 2014 model is there for quite reasonably priced because it's an older model, but it doesn't have a 4K60 output so I can't use it, so it meant I had to go to the 2018 model. The problem with that is that that's still the current model, so when you're buying them even on the used market, they still command quite a high price because they're still essentially the, the latest model. I've been looking for like last couple of months or so, and the used ones have always been showing up round about the 500 to 600 pound mark, which is quite a lot for a used machine, especially given it's 799 new, so it's you're not saving that much. I've seen a few new in-box Mac Minis popping up now and then, but they all looked really shady. They were coming from sellers with no feedback, and the pictures were either stock photos or obvious screenshots of other listings. But this one was listed from Curry's, which for people outside the UK, Curry's is a big name electrical store. It's like Best Buy in the US. But this was only £499, which for the base model 2018 is really cheap given it costs £799 new. And then, at the time that I bought this, there was like a 5% off selected sellers eBay promo thing going on, so I got that as well. So I only actually paid 475 for this, then got an extra sort of £4.70 odd from top cashback, because I get 1% cashback from eBay. And then when you take the extra points, I probably only paid about 470 for this, and then through my Amex credit card, I'll get another 5% cash back. So then that's even more off, but that'll come in about a year's time, so that's a while off. But when you're taking all the cash back deals and stuff I've got, I probably paid under £450 for this, which is really good. Now there is one catch with this. I keep saying this is a 2018 base model, and it is, but it's not the same base model as if you went out now to the Apple store and bought a base model 2018 Mac Mini. That's because at the start of 2020, they did a spec bump increasing the base model's 128 gigs of storage to 256. That's why this was so cheap. This is the old base model, which only has 128 gigs of storage. But other than that, the specs are identical, even down to the processor generation. The current one, if you went to the Apple store and bought a brand new Mac Mini, would still only have an 8th generation processor because they don't seem to update them for some reason. But this does mean that I saved over £300, and the only real downgrade is that I lost half the storage. But that's not a big deal. For me, it's replacing a machine with a 6 gig SSD that doesn't store any data locally anyway, and you've also got Thunderbolt 3, so you can just fit a really fast external SSD. And even if I was using this where I needed storage, I'd gladly save £300 and buy a Thunderbolt SSD. So now let's take a look at the specs. Now here on the back we can see the specs. This has a 3.6GHz quad-core i3. This is a Coffee Lake i3-8100B. And this is quite an important thing with this new 2018 model Mac Mini over the previous generation. The previous generation used laptop CPUs, so they were lower power and lower voltage, and they weren't as powerful. This uses a desktop CPU. The i3-8100B is the exact same as the i3-8100. All the B means is that it's a BGA chip, so it's soldered to the motherboard, rather than a normal socketed CPU. However, other than that, it's identical to the i3-8100B. And if you go up to the higher end ones with a quad with a 6 core i5 and 6 core i7s, those are also full desktop 65 watt CPUs. So you get quite a lot of power in these. But I've just gone with the base model. So that's 3.6 GHz quad core. And the reason 3.6 is quite a high clock speed compared to the other ones, the i5 and the i7, is that i3 doesn't support turbo boost. It also doesn't have hyper threading, but for my use it's fine. Next up you've got the RAM. This has 8 gigs of 2666 DDR4. And what's good to see is that they use 2666 MHz, so they do actually use slightly higher than sort of the cheapest speed of RAM, they use slightly higher speed RAM, and this does come with two sticks, so it is running in dual channel mode, which when you look at a lot of the sort of cheaper small form factor optiplexes and things from Dell and companies like that, a lot of them only come with a single stick of RAM as standard, so it's quite nice to get dual channel memory. 
And yes, I'm saying sticks of RAM because the RAM in this is upgradable. That means if you're buying one of these, unless you're doing like a big business deployment where you've not got the time to upgrade the RAM, or you're doing it and you're just not confident to upgrade the RAM yourself, don't pay Apple for the RAM upgrades because they charge so much. You can just buy this with the base 8GB of RAM, buy standard DDR4 laptop memory, and stick it in. There's a few torque screws, it's a little bit fiddlier than the average machine, but yep, you can just upgrade it with standard RAM. 128 gigs of PCIe SSD. This is soldered to the motherboard, so you can't upgrade that annoyingly. But it is NVMe PCIe, so it will be fast. Apart from that, you've got Intel HD Graphics 630, it's just standard onboard graphics. Various other specs, and we'll take a look at the rest once we get into it. The base model also comes with gigabit ethernet. You can, however, spec it up to 10 gig ethernet for only about £100 more, but I've not bothered with that here because, well, this was a pre-made, it wasn't a configured to order one, and I do not need 10 gig ethernet on this, it's streaming video mostly. But yeah, that's specs. So nothing insane, but it should still be pretty powerful, and definitely way more powerful than I need. Okay, so let's get into it. So it's in a plastic wrap, I've not even remotely taken this out yet, so let's just go inside and take a look. It's there, just cut it open. I don't really know what I'm planning for this video in terms of like the, the full content of it. It's just more, it's not really going to be a full review, it's more just going to be like a vlog of my experience with it more than anything. So I'll do an unboxing, show the product, set it up and talk about it, and then I'll sort of come back with my review of how I found it and all that sort of stuff. So let's pop it open. So, slide it out. And there's the Mac Mini. It's been so long since I've unboxed, unboxed a new Apple product. The last time I unboxed a new one would have either been an iPod Touch in 2012, if that counts, or like a couple of months before that, a 2012 MacBook Pro, or late 2011 MacBook Pro that I got in 2012. Everything else I've bought is used, so it's quite weird unboxing Apple products. It takes me back to my early days of YouTube doing unboxing videos. But yeah, there's Mac Mini there. As tradition dictates, you put that to one side, and then we look at the thing that it comes with. So you get the little book of paperwork which is obviously a lot smaller than, than the old Macs that would come with like CDs and all that sort of stuff. So all you get is, is instructions, which I'm pretty sure will just be, here's how to plug it in and then figure the rest out yourself. Yeah, it, okay, it's literally just, here's how to plug it in. Warranty stuff, warranty stuff, Apple stickers, what else would you expect? And then under here, you're gonna get a power cable. So that lifts up like that. And then in here, we have the power cable, which is just standard, you know, UK plug or whatever plug your country is, going to a, a, quarter, a figure, figure of eight IC connector. So yeah, that's it there. So what I'll now do is dig into the Mac Mini. Okay, so here we've got the Mac Mini itself. So it's got this sort of thing you peel off, so we'll just turn it upside down. This is what Apple really have got their sort of packaging nailed. Not that it's really important, but yeah. Take that out. I'm going to be very careful with this and actually preserve all the packaging because with Apple products, reselling it, you get a lot more if you've got it all in its original packaging. So I'm actually going to keep all this because, yeah, you could actually get quite a bit more money from it by keeping it in its packaging. So I'll put that over there. And now we've got the machine itself, so we'll turn it the right way up. So plastic film on the back here as well. So let's peel that off and that will reveal the ports. And this is a very nice looking machine. Now in the interest of full disclosure, when I do an unboxing video, I deliberately try not to look at the product off camera, so that when I'm on camera I can give my full honest first impressions. However with the Mac Mini, that's a little bit difficult, because I have actually seen one of these before in person. In fact I've got it here. There was a bit of an issue when I started making this video. I bought a 2018 Mac Mini, the exact same one from Curry's, and it turned up. I filmed the whole unboxing video, and during that I noticed that there was a little bit of damage to the outside of the box. Box was also a bit bashed because Curry shipped it in a jiffy bag because that's apparently how you ship them back, but anyway. This is because in Curry's infinite wisdom when they shipped it to me, they did nothing more than put the Apple box, just the Apple retail packaging, in a jiffy bag and then sent it through DPD. So I thought, well, it's annoying the box is damaged, but it's fine, I'll, I'll live with it. But then when I took the Mac Mini out, I saw this. It's got this massive big scratch on the side of it, which just looks terrible and it feels really rough, like it's, it's really annoying. Now, had this just been only for me and I was going to keep it for the rest of my life, I probably wouldn't have... I would have been annoyed and I would have maybe tried to get it replaced, but I wouldn't have been so annoyed. 
but the problem is with Max is that, they, is that they hold the resale value quite well. And having any damage like this on it, especially on a desktop that wouldn't normally have damage, with a laptop you get a bit more leeway, this would knock a huge amount off the resale value. So I thought, well, I'm not having that. So I've got another one. And while I could have probably returned this and gotten to do a full refund or a full exchange, that was going to take too long because I'd have to send this one back, wait for them to process it, send me a new one out. And I just thought that wasn't worth the wait. So instead what I did is bought another one. That's this one here that we'll look at. And then I'll return this one now I've got the new one. But yeah, that was really annoying. On the plus side, when I got the new one, it did actually come in a proper cardboard box, which was actually the one that was shipped in from Apple. And then the Apple retail packaging was inside it. So all I can think is the one I got beforehand was like a customer return where they lost the outer box and just decided to ship it like that because, yeah, that was ridiculous. But anyway, now we've got a nice unscratched, good condition Mac Mini to take a look at. So now here we've got the machine. And as you can see, unlike the old Mac Minis which were silver, this one's now space grey and it looks lovely. It's actually quite a dark space grey, it looks a little bit darker than my laptop. But this, I don't know if that's just what they're going for now or maybe the desktops have this darker space grey but it does look brilliant. As you can see on top, you've got the Apple logo. Different very sort of shiny. I just love the look of this thing. Absolutely nothing on the front apart from a power LED. They've got rid of the old IR remote receiver they used to have. And then round the back, we can see the I.O. Now the I.O. on this is quite good. You've got obviously the power switch, not I.O, but you've got power switch. The, the AC power input, and this is good. It's got a built-in power supply. A lot of small form factor machines use power, external power bricks, but it's really nice to see an internal power supply. It's not too big a deal for someone like me who's just running this in a cupboard as one machine, or if you're running it on a desk, although it is nice not to have to hide a power supply somewhere. But these are also marketed as sort of like servers or build workstations or, you know, render hosts and all this sort of stuff. They're like Apple's small server. And if you're building any sort of cluster of these where you've got a lot of them, especially in a tight rack form factor, you don't want to have to deal with external power supplies. So having an internal power supply is really good. There's a gigabit ethernet. Of course, this could be 10 gig if you, if you spec that in. Four Thunderbolt 3 ports, which is great. I'm moving all my stuff over to Thunderbolt 3, or at least USB-C, because I've got the USB-C MacBook. So all I've done is on my, like, my phone, I've just bought a USB-C to USB-C cable. I've bought a micro USB to USB-C cable for my like camera and things like that. So. Most of my stuff anyway is USB-C, so it's nice to have a lot of Thunderbolt 3 ports. And this also means that you don't really need to worry about having the limited internal storage, because you can just plug external Thunderbolt 3 SSDs in and get really good speeds. These can also be used for things like eGPUs, because you've only got the integrated graphics in this, but you could get one of these, couple it with an eGPU, and get a really powerful little system. HDMI 2.0, this is a big requirement for me, because I'm connecting this up to an AV receiver, which goes into a 4K TV. I need to get full 4K60. So I needed HDMI 2.0, which is why I had to get a 2018 model. None of the older models would have done it. Finally, you've got a pair of USB-A ports, which is still good to see because even though I'm moving over everything to USB-C, it's good to have these for things like, for example, my webcam. I'll be doing a lot of video calls from this machine because COVID, and my webcam just has a USB-A connector on it and I can't replace the cable. So it's nice to just be able to plug it straight into that. It's good, you know, they've got the space, why not put them in? And then a headphone jack, which is just a picture of headphones. I assume it's maybe combined with a headset. I'm not sure, but headphone jack there. The only notable omission from this is any sort of SD card reader. I'm sure the old Mac Minis used to have it. So it is really a bit annoying that this doesn't have anything because <laughs> there's a lot of space here you could have put an SD card reader in. You know, you, you move the headphone jack over here and then you put the SD card reader here or something like that. It is really daft not including it. Obviously you can just use an external one, but for something like this, I would have expected an SD card reader. I know a lot of small form factor business machines don't come with them, but it's a Mac. You, you want to be able to put your memory card in from, in from your camera. So yeah, I would have liked to see an SD card reader. It's not the biggest deal. I can just use a USB one or Thunderbolt one or not use a card reader because this won't ever be using, I won't ever use a card reader with this machine, but it does seem like a bit of, an, a, bit of a weird mission. Then finally on the bottom, we've got this removable plate here. This unclips from around the edges and that's how you can access the RAM. You unclip that and there's a lot of bits to remove but you can actually get the insides through this. And yeah, that's on the bottom. Definitely very nice. I oh, want a big air vent on the back as well, I forgot to mention that. So yeah, that's the air vent for cooling it. And it'll be interesting to see what the thermals are like on this because it is quite a small machine to have a 65 watt CPU in it. But yeah, definitely seems really nice. So I suppose all that's left to do now 
is plug this in and fire it up. Okay, so let's fire it up for the first time. So I've got to connect it to power, I've got to connect to this monitor over HDMI. This is a 4K monitor, so it'll be interesting to see if it run, runs at the full resolution correctly. I've then connected up this wireless keyboard and touchpad thing just because it's easy. And then I've got to connect it to Ethernet for the network because I'll probably need to activate iCloud and set all that sort of stuff up. Obviously I could use Wi-Fi, but it's going to be connected to the Ethernet in its final home, so I may as well just set it up over Ethernet here and not have to join it to the Wi-Fi. So let's turn on power and then power it up. So switch the main on here. And then turn it on with power switches on the back. The switch on the back is a little bit annoying because if it's on like a shelf, you have to leave enough space to get your hand around the back. You couldn't put a shelf really close to the top. But I suppose that's good for ventilation. So yeah, turn it on there. The little LED on the front's come on. And we should see it boot up for the first time. There we go. That looks like the correct resolution. That's now gone a weird colour, but I'm sure it's fine, hopefully. There we go. Yep, we're in. Yeah, it's definitely scaled to be quite small, but that is running. And yep, that looks like 4K resolution if we go into the monitor details and then figure out how we get to tell me. Yeah, that's running at, so well, it's running at 60 hertz and that resolution is definitely 4K. So it is actually running at the full HDMI 2.0 sort of um, spec. So that's really good. Yeah, the 4K resolution there. So yep, that's good, it's running at 4K 60. So all I need to do now is run through this whole setup process, do all the weird iCloud stuff, and then hopefully I should be able to come back with it fully working. So there we go, that's now booted to the desktop. The setup process was really easy, just go through the wizard, log in with iCloud, and it's worked. However, the one thing you might notice is this wallpaper, and that shows us it's running Mojave. It's not been updated to Catalina yet. That's because it's probably been sitting in a box for like months if not over, like you can even be sitting in the box for like a couple of years at this point and it's just not been updated to the latest version that's fine i'll just have to go into like about this mac hit software update and run the update to catalina that's dead easy to do so it's not really a big issue at all so i'll go away off camera get it all updated get it set up in the living room i'll then go and use it for like a few days whatever just a short period of time and then i'll come back with my full review so there we go that's updated to catalina and working on my tv now I did find one slight quirk with this. I got it all set up and it all looked fine. But then I looked really closely and the text didn't look quite sharp enough. And then I looked at my TV and it was rep still reporting 4K. But then I dug into my AV receiver settings and found that its scaler was switched on. So it was scaling everything up to 4K for the TV. So I turned that off, checked the TV again, and then found that the Mac Mini was only running at 1080p, which was a bit concerning. So naturally I dug into the display settings just to work out what the problem was. So I opened some preferences, went to displayed, displays, and found it was set to default for display. So I thought, that's weird, why is it defaulting to that? So I hit scaled, which lets you pick other resolutions, picked the correct resolution, and sure enough, it jumped over and showed the correct 4K resolution. But as you can see, everything is scaled to be really small. It's running at 100% scaling, essentially. And it's not giving that Apple-style, more space, larger text scale settings. Instead, it just asked me to pick resolutions, which is really weird. So there's two solutions I found that will fix this. And it really just depends on your setup. Now, the first one I found is probably the most likely to work, or the one you're going to have least issues with. And that is to force high DPI mode. So by default, it seems that Macs detect if you've got a high DPI display, or what it calls a high DPI screen, which is essentially like a retina display, where the screen is really high resolution, and then you want to scale the text up to fit it. So the text larger, but you've got really sharp, sharp resolution because the screen itself is quite high resolution. Now, it doesn't seem to detect my AV receiver and TV combination as a high DPI display, which is why I'm getting this interface. And when I pick the 4K resolution, it just runs at 100% scaling. You can, however, force it to enable high DPI mode. And when you do that, it will then let you enable high DPI resolutions that are scaled. So to do that, you pop up a terminal and run this command here, I'll put it on the screen. Run that, obviously it's a, you're using sudo, so you need to put the root password in, or just your user password that will then enable sudo. So now that's entered, we now need to reboot the Mac, and then we'll come back when it's done, and I'll show you how to enable the high DPI resolutions. So now I've rebooted after running that command, and if we check the TV, we can still see we're still running at 1080p. 
But now if we go back into display settings, go to scaled, you'll see there's now this 960 by 540 high DPI resolution. That's still no use because when you hit that, it'll run the TV at 1080p and scale it down to look like that resolution, which is just hideous. So what you need to do is you need to go back to default for display, hold down the option key on your keyboard and hit scaled. And this shows even more resolutions. And the one I wanted from here is one that's listed as 1920 by 1080 high DPI. If we pick this, the TV will switch over. The TV will then switch to 4K resolution, as you can see in the corner, but the text's all the same size. And this is now correctly scaling it. So it's outputting a 4K signal and then scaling all the text to be equivalent to 1080p. And now looking at some text here, we can see the clarity difference between running it at 1080p and running at this new high DPI resolution that outputs the proper 4K signal. So that was one way to enable it, but there is another way. And that is to make sure you've enabled the enhanced HDMI format on all your devices. So when I set this whole environment up, I turned that off because I was having issues with the cable that goes from the TV to the AV receiver through the wall. I don't think it's a very good cable and I was having weird dropout and interference issues if I enabled enhanced HDMI mode. And that's what you need to use full HDR and stuff. So I just turned it off until I could get around to fixing the cable and figuring it out. But just to test it here, I tried turning all that back on again and I haven't found the dropout, so it might be better now, it's just a bit flaky. And that did seem to fix it. So obviously this massively depends on all your equipment. On here I've got a Denon AV receiver, so if we go into the setup menu on this, we can go in, go down to video, 4K signal format, and switch from standard to enhanced. That's just on on the AV receiver. You also need to do that on your TV as well. However, on my TV it's already enabled. So in theory, if we now hit default for display with the enhanced mode switched on, you'll now see that it'll go to the full 4K resolution. And we've, no we've got it set to default for display, so it's now defaulting to the correct resolution. It also lets me enable high dynamic range, so we can enable HDR here, and that'll work because we've got that enhanced signal path on the receiver and also enabled on the TV itself. So that's definitely fixed it for me. However, it's worth bearing in mind the way that you can manually enable high DPI mode because it is possible that in some scenarios you can't enable enhanced HDMI. For example, here it's really marginal with that cable. And if that cable was any longer or a little bit more dodgy, this wouldn't work at all. So it is worth, worth noting that you may find that on certain setups you have to force high DPI mode to let you scale the TV. On Windows it's a little bit easier because you just pick the resolution and then you pick a percentage scaling for all the, deep, for all the text and the UI interface elements and that works irrespective of your display. Whereas on a Mac, it tries to detect high DPI displays and provide different options. But now that we're running with the correct HDMI signal path and it's detecting the high DPI display, now, as you'd expect, if we hit scaled here, we can now get this interface up where you can pick like, looks like 1920 by 1080, it looks like 1280 by 720, and you can easily scale it up and down correctly to a lot of different interim resolutions. So this is definitely the preferable option. So if you can enable enhanced HDMI mode on all your devices, definitely do it. But if you have issues, I've also shown how to do the high DPI manual override. As for the performance, this thing definitely seems absolutely perfect. Sure, it's not the most powerful machine in the world, and it's especially not the most powerful Mac Mini. But for my use case here, just watching video and just using it for general web browsing type tasks and video calls, it's more than powerful enough. And even then, I think it could probably do quite a bit of, quite a bit of powerful work. If we check out the specs here, even though it's, or I've already said them, we can go to about this Mac. And then in here we can see that we've got the 3.6 gigahertz i3, 8 gigs of RAM, and Intel, H Intel UHD graphics. Displays just shows up my TV as you'd expect. Although interesting, it actually fully correctly picks up the TV size now, it's 49 inch, so I wonder if that was part of the high DPI thing, is knowing the size, don't know. But yeah, picks that up there. Storage, we can see we've got the storage. This doesn't have much installed, but you can see there's a reasonable amount free. Not a huge amount if you needed to store a lot of work, but there is some there for applications. Memory, we can see it is correctly detecting the two sticks of RAM. So we do have those two sticks for dual channel performance and then various other bits of support stuff. Next up, we can take a look at the speed test. So if we search for Black, not the Black, Black Magic speed test, oh, open that, we can do a disk speed test. So if we run the speed test on the SSD, we can see that the write speeds aren't insane. They're like 600, 700 megabytes a second, which is still fast enough. It's way beyond a SATA SSD, but it's still not as fast as I'd expect. As I'd expect. But the read speeds are absolutely brilliant, you know, 2000 megabytes a second reads fine. And the writes aren't terrible. So it is still a pretty fast SSD. And especially with the really high read performance being a PCIe SSD, 
it just makes machines so responsive to launch applications because it's got that power there, which is really good to see. Next up, we can quit out of this and we can look at Geekbench. So there's obviously a lot of benchmarks published online, so I'm not going to really bang on too much about the performance here, but we'll run a benchmark here. And what's interesting to see is that the Geekbench benchmarks are actually based on a nine, on an i3-8100 processor as the base benchmark, benchmark of a thousand. So what we'll do is we'll run this. It'll be interesting to see how close this gets to the Geekbench benchmark, given it actually has the same CPU as the one they've based it on. So we'll let this run and see what it comes back with. So there we go, we've got the results. And as you can see, we've got a score of 908, which is lower than what they said for the i3-8100 as their like base of a thousand, but it's still pretty good. And if we go over to the Mac Benchmarks tab here, we can see that we find the 8100B late 2018 Mac Mini here, and that got 913, so it's basically exactly the same. So yep, it's at least performing as it should. And while those benchmark results aren't insane, it's still really good. If you look around here, it still compares very closely to like a 13 inch latest generation MacBook Pro, it compares to like a few of the older iMacs, you know, even some of the Retina iMacs. So it's not an absolutely screamingly powerful machine, but as like a really, you know, 500 odd pound Mac that's brand new, it performs pretty sort of admirably. Obviously that's just CPU performance, you've definitely not got much GPU performance on here, but you can plug eGPUs into it. So yeah, it does perform pretty well. And if you look down here, we can find the old Mac Mini as well, and it'll absolutely knock it out of the park. So you can see, yeah, the old Mac Mini here got 760 single core, and I bet if you look at the multi-core, because it's only a, the old one's only a dual core, and look at the Mac Mini in here, we'll find that the old one, well, the late 2012 got 2801, which is obviously still lower than 3336, and the late 2012 was a quad core. They actually downgraded it to 2014, meaning the 2014 only has 1643 because it's only it only went up to dual core, so this is a huge performance jump. But you'd expect that after four years between the two models. And now as a final test, I want to just check how the sort of power management and thermals are working. So what we'll do is we'll run the Intel Power Gadget. This will let us monitor the CPU power consumption, the clock frequency, as well as the temperature. Now this CPU won't won't turbo boost because the i3 doesn't support turbo boosting. But it'll be good to see, does this actually look like thermal throttle and drop down, or does it consistently manage its full clock speed? And I've not tested this before, so it'll be interesting to see. Now, I'm just going to use Cinebench for this, just because it seems like the easiest thing just to stress the CPU out. Of course, I could use Prime 95, but this gives us like a useful score as well. So I'll pull up Cinebench R20, click the EULA, move that over there just so we can see it until PowerGadget at the same time. And we'll run this and we'll monitor what happens to CPU clock speed and then what happens to the thermals. And this machine's sitting in a cupboard, so it's got, it's got a bit of space around it, but this is quite an average use case for this machine. It's not totally open in like a really chilled environment. It's in a room, it's a standard room temperature, and it is in a cupboard that slightly restricts the airflow around it. So let's run it. Now one weird thing I've spotted here is this is actually reporting it as two core, four thread. That's not correct. This is actually a quad core processor. Especially like even according to the Intel specs, it's quad core, it's not dual core with hyperthreading. So I don't know why it's reporting that, that's definitely weird. It must be a bug, because that's definitely not correct, it is a quad core chip. But that's it running there. And as we can see over here, the temperature is definitely rising, we're at about, yeah, 75.9 degrees. Oh, well, on the package, and then 77 on the core. And then, here we can see at the clock speed, we are running at the full 3.6 gigahertz. So it's not thermal throttling under this test yet. The CPU is definitely heating up but it's not at any way, in any way thermal throttling. So now the temperature is roughly stabled out about 88, 89 degrees. So it is running quite hot, but we can still see it's still running at the full 3.6 gigahertz core speed. And the key thing I've noticed is it's really quiet. The fan's moving a little bit more air than it was before, you can feel a bit of air coming out, but I'm maybe a metre or two from the machine, and I can't hear a thing, and even getting quite close to it, it was extremely quiet. So this isn't remotely like a MacBook or anything where the fans ramp up and they, you, you hear it, it sounds like it's taking off. This thing at full load and running quite hot, the fans are pretty much inaudible. 
So that makes it ideal for a home theatre machine because my old one was a full desktop CPU with a standard stock AMD cooler on it. And if Windows Update ran in the background when you're watching a video, you could hear the fan ramp up in it and it was really annoying. This machine is totally silent, which is great. But yeah, that's test finishing and it's good to see there's no sort of thermal throttling happening here. It seems to be absolutely fine. And as you can see, yep, finished the test. The cores dropped down to lower clock speed because it doesn't need to be maxing out anymore. And we can see the thermals are very quickly dropping down and the temperature is quickly dropping off to a more sensible level. But that's really good to see that it definitely didn't thermal throttle even though it did run quite hot and it was totally silent throughout the whole process. And there we've got a Cinebench score of 1396, which does seem like pretty good performance. So yeah, from a performance perspective, while this base model isn't a massive powerhouse, it's pretty good. And then being able to spec this up to a 6 core i7 and still use a full 65 watt desktop CPU in it, that combined with an eGPU would be a really nice little powerful machine. Or if you don't need GPU performance, even standalone, it would still be pretty powerful. So there we go, that was a look at the 2018 Mac Mini that I've bought. And I'm really happy with this thing. While the base model is quite expensive from Apple, the fact that I paid probably about £470 for this after all the cash back and discounts I got, makes this a really good price. And I'm really happy with the performance. And while yes, I don't need a Mac for this environment, a little basic Intel NUC would be absolutely fine. Just having a full Mac OS machine here is just really nice to have. And in terms of just the quietness and performance, I'm really happy with this machine. So yeah, there we go. Thank you very much for watching. And if you're interested in buying this, I've put links in the description to the listing from Curry's that should hopefully help you get it for that price I paid, the 499. There's also that eBay voucher code that'll probably run for a couple of more days after this video goes to live. So obviously if you're watching this video a year in the future, you're not gonna be able to get that. But I have put a link in the description so it will link to the listing. So if you're interested in buying one of these, if you're quick, you might be able to get it with that discount. But yeah, it does go to show that even though they're quite expensive from Apple, sometimes retailers will put on sales on these and you can get them for quite a reasonable price. And one of these for £500 or less definitely seems like a good deal. So yeah, thank you very much for watching.